Well, good morning. Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Good. It's good to see all your smiling faces. If you'll please stand, we're going to start off our worship with Glorious is Thy Name. Thank you. 
morning. Let us let us pray. Father God, this morning we want to come before you. We want to praise your name because it is holy. And Father, your name is blessed. And Father, today as we enter this time of, of worship, Lord, I pray today that you will draw us to yourself. Father God, that uh, you will help us and enable us, Lord, to put aside all those things that distract us and help us, Lord, to do what, Lord, what would you call us to do, to sit at your feet, to hear what you have to say. Father, because we know you have something for us. As we continue our worship, Father, I pray that today, Lord, the songs that come out of our mouth are a reflection of our heart, Father, that brings a smile to your face. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning. Good morning. I had to turn my lapel on. I uh, want, to, want to welcome here to First Baptist Church, Harbor Oaks. We're glad you're here. If you're a first-time guest, you should have got a bulletin when you came in uh, from one of our greeters. On that bulletin, there's a little, there's a little tear-off sheet. It's got two sides to it. We'd like for you to fill that out as you, uh, as you, as you uh, can and put that in the offering place as, as it comes by later. We like to have a record of all of our guests here today, and so we want to let you know that we're glad you're here today. And so I want to thank you for that. Uh, I do have a couple of uh, quick announcements uh, briefly. Uh, first of all, y'all be praying for uh, Wayne Beal's brother. Uh, Linda and Wayne are not with us today. Wayne, uh, Wayne's brother, Charlie, uh, had a nasty fall here recently, and he's in rough shape. And so they're having to be home with him. So y'all continue to pray for, for Wayne and Linda as well as Wayne's brother, Charlie. And so I wanted to share that with you. Also, when you came in, there was a, in the table in the foyer. You'll find a lot of dough, bread, and pastries, and that sort of thing. I was waiting to see if anybody was listening to that. Uh, we had a huge uh, pickup from uh, Wawa this week, a lot more than we usually get for our food pantry ministry. If you need some bread, I mean, you don't have to need bread. If you want some bread or you want some pastries because there's some donuts and stuff back there too, uh, it's all free. If you want any of that, just on your way out, just look at the table, grab what you want, and it's all yours, okay? You just want to make sure that you avail yourself of that. When we do have extra, we do want to share that with our church family. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord today? Yes. Amen. Let's continue our worship. Our scripture this morning comes from Colossians chapter 1, verses 3 through 10. We always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid upon laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and growing, as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God and truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So as we walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Thank you. 
men as our ushers come forward for their for our offertory. Uh, let's continue to pray for our members that are not here with us today. Uh, continue to pray, and I also ask that you would pray for our guest uh, speaker today, uh, Brother uh, Reverend Martin Bell is going to be preaching for us today, and so I ask that you would be praying for him. And so let's go to the Lord in prayer as we do that. Father God, I just want to thank you, Lord, for the opportunity, Lord, to be able to come in before you to worship Father in song. And now we have the opportunity, Lord, to worship Father through our giving. And I ask today, Father, that you would bless everything that is given, multiply it for your kingdom's sake, and I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Glad for the cross and glad for the blood that he shed on the cross for our sins. And when he was hanging there, he thought of each one of us. He knew us and he loved us and that's why he did it.
Well, before uh, I'm not sure this is on, gentlemen, but I don't think it's working. That's okay. Um, I'm not preaching today. I'm just throwing that out there, okay? And uh, I do miss being in the pulpit, but I'm, I'm here to tell you, I want to introduce our guest speaker. Brother Marty Bell uh, is the Director of Missions of our Halifax Baptist Association. Um, he is the go-between between us, churches in this area, and the Florida Baptist Convention. But a lot more than that, he's a friend of mine. And uh, since my arrival in 2017, when uh, through a baptism of fire, which is kind of what it felt like when I arrived here, uh, Marty has been with me every step of the way. And I don't, I'm not really sure why I haven't had him come preach earlier, but that's probably on me. But uh, he's going to be bringing the message this morning from God's Word. And I just wanted to thank him for coming, and I hope you make him feel welcome. Brother Marty. It's great to be here with you. I got to tell you, I, I think your your sanctuary, your building, is absolutely beautiful. I love what you all have done with it. Um, and and I hear things. People tell me, other pastors drive by, and they have mentioned, wow, what's going on at First Oak Hill? I, I'm not, not Oak Hill, but First Harbor Oaks. I was at Oak Hill last uh, a week or so ago. But uh, they, they say, you know, uh, you can you can tell you all have done some some really just some real update, upgrade, and it's just absolutely beautiful, and it's a marked uh, difference. Um, I got to pre- tell you, I appreciate your, your pastor and his family. You all are great, and your my wife is a teacher too, so I understand. Okay, <laughs> it's a lot during uh, COVID uh, and what uh, churches have, have gone through and dealt with, and every time you think you're over it, something else gets hit with it again. And we just uh, pray it through. I also want to tell you something else. I want to thank this church, uh, not for your, not only for your faithfulness, um, but uh, I started here um, nine years ago. Um, you, you need to know this. This church um, was a, a real godsend in helping us start not one, but two biker churches. Um, I got out here and I was preaching here. You without a pastor. Uh, for, so I was here off and on for several months. And I was here uh, during the first, my first ex- understanding of uh, a Biketoberfest. And that's really not even the big one. And I could not hear myself speaking because of all the, uh, the bikes going by. And I got out in it and um, I, I, I called around that day and I said, do we have a biker church? And the answer was no. I said, we, God just like, we're going to have a, a biker church. And we, we, we did get one about three or four months after that. Uh, God just, just blessed our association. And we, we started uh, two biker churches uh, since my arrival being here, but this was the place. This was ground zero. Uh, but, and I got to tell you, I, I, I have four kids. Uh, and they are all adult. My youngest, my oldest just got back from Afghanistan. My second one is a teacher. My third is a teacher. She just got married, my only girl. And my youngest son, who turns 22 at the end of this month, is a special needs son. And so he's autistic. And so it's always hopping in our family. But you need to know, um, my older sons have a way of, of taking my shoes. And, and I don't know, I mean, they're, they're always borrowing my things. And so when I go places, I always look at the pastor's shoes because I'm always looking for shoes. And and so I appreciate your shoes. I, I'm looking at my shoes. I'm serious. I, I am serious. I have to I have to keep my shoes in the trunk sometimes. If, uh, but um, anyhow, I'm the director of missions for Halifax Baptist Association. You all have heard. We are in the middle of walking through a merge with our sister association, Seminole. We're going to create a, a new name and a new association. And really, why we're doing this, uh, it's it's partially, uh, it is not a financial reason, but there are financial reasons and conditions and understandings in it. Uh, we're basically enlarging the territory. For uh, We'll include all of Volusia County and Flagler County, but our association will now encompass uh, Deland, Sanford, Lake Mary, and parts of Orlando. And so uh, Seminole will have access to the beaches, and we have access over there. And so we're just joining um, 
through COVID, we, we've been talking and praying through this, but COVID uh, moved it up about two years. And so at, we've lost some churches. We've, we've had some churches close. We've had some churches go through some, you know, a lot of churches are just going through difficulty and associations are going through difficulty. And so through it all, we're just looking and praying through what God um, has for us. But this will, our, our new association will, will have somewhere around uh, 70 churches. Um, between the two associations and a lot of uh, a lot of ongoing ministries, and it's, my prayer has been the prayer of Jabez, uh, and so um, we just are enlarging the territory. Um, but I just want to tell you that um, my my prayer, and also uh, Pastor Mike, you tell me if I go over, you just go like give me the high sign, and 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 we'll be <laughs> we'll be done. Um, but uh, for today, we want to look at um, uh, John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. Knowing Jesus, knowing and understanding Christ, uh, and hope and security for people living in the fast lane, especially during times as which we are all living in. Uh, if we could stand in, wherever I go, I always ask that uh, we stand in honor of reading God's word. So if we could read together John 14, verses 1 through 6, and I will... I'll be reading out of the, uh, uh, not New King James Version, but NIV. So it's a little different. I, I apologize. But uh, New International Version, Jesus said this to his disciples. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God or believe in God. If you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. Some of your translations say mansions or dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. Um, then he says this. I am, I know the way to the place where I'm going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. Now how can we know the way? And Jesus said this. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Thank you. You may be seated and let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you um, for being our God, our Savior, our rock and our friend, our Redeemer, our salvation. Father, we thank you for the church here, First Baptist of Harbor Oaks, its history and its love for your kingdom, its place here and its mission and purpose here in this area. We're just so thankful for this perfect place that it can be placed here to reach this community for you. I'm just so thankful, Father, for the pastor, um, family, and Father, those who are just here. We pray, Father, as we look at the passage of Scripture, we pray that everything that we say and do would be, would be in keeping with your will and your wishes. And I pray, more than anything else, that when we leave here in the next few moments, Father, we pray for the power of your Holy Spirit, that we be forever changed, that we be more mature in you, that we be closer to you because of our time, our worship experience with you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. There's nothing like being caught between a rock and a hard place, right? And nowhere to go. It's one thing to be able to wake up and to go day by day, and do your thing, and life is grand, and everything is all right. Everything is just hunky-dory, whether it's at school, whether it's the workplace, whether it's at home. But when those difficult situations come up, when I've studied for the test, then I, I don't do well. Or when I go to work and I do my best, and somehow, some way, the, the boss just didn't like it, it didn't measure up, or Something is happening at home, whether it's a roof leak, whether whatever it is. Those decisions that we have to make, those decisions that who we are in Christ, between a rock and a hard place, right? It's not easy to be between a hard place and a rock and not know where to turn. Well, today as we look at this 14th chapter, uh, Jesus is with his disciples. Um, he's at that place. He's preparing his disciples for a time when 
he would not be with them. He's giving them final instructions and words of comfort and security and words of confidence and strength. And the disciples, as you know, they, they didn't always catch on to what Jesus was trying to show them and teach them and be with them. And he showed them miracles. He performed miracles. He taught them things. He says all these things to them. And, and you know, you could just tell sometimes they just didn't get it. And so now he's preparing them for this place. It's difficult. And he has given them signs and wonders and the healings of the nobleman, the heal all through the Gospel of John, the walking on the water, the healing of the blind man, the raising of Lazarus, uh, the discourses, discourses where he has um, taught them about what it means to be a believer in Christ, the bread of life, the, the light of the world, the good shepherd, and all of that. And still, they're not getting it. And so he leaves them with these words of comfort and security for God's children. Um, and he says this. He says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't be anxious. Don't worry. And that trouble is anxiety. Let your heart not be troubled. It's a negative imperative in Greek. Don't let your heart be overcome with turmoil. Don't. What he's saying literally is don't be to a place where you allow yourself to be intimidated by the situation. Now, the disciples had reason to be troubled. Jesus has just told them that one of them was a traitor, that all of them would deny him, and that he would, they would leave, he would leave them at that night. All of this would legitimately trouble the disciples, and Jesus tells them, don't let your hearts be troubled. Wouldn't it be great to live a life without issues or troubles or problems or obstacles. Wouldn't it be great if we could just have that heaven on earth, right? But Jesus never told us that our lives would not have trouble, but he promised us that we could have an untroubled heart in a troubled life. And in Greek, it's, it's, it's more of an imperative, a command. Don't be this way. Now, the heart is where we get cardio heart issues. It's the center of our being, the heart of the religious, spiritual life. The heart is our seat of understanding, the area or sphere of operation for grace. Emotion, yes, is included. We talk about heart issues, emotions, but so much more than emotion. It's who we are. And when something has our heart, it has our full attention, right? And so the idea is Troubled is anxiety or affliction or distress or adversity. And when I'm worried about something, my whole being is turned inside. It's the idea of watching what guards our heart. Um, Jesus says, don't be distressed. And yet we worry, don't we? The reality is we worry. We worry about our jobs, our kids, our family, our church, our friends. Uh, our issues of politics, the world situation, um, just name it. Like I said, I have four kids and four separate understandings of anxiety and work. <laughs> it's what we do. Um, and Jesus said, don't be this way. He said, believe in me and believe is to trust. It means to place your trust in, to give God that understanding of trust. Instead of giving in to a troubled heart, Jesus told them to firmly put their trust in God and Jesus himself. And this is a radical understanding, a radical call to Jesus, just as one would trust in God the Father. It's a radical promise that in doing so, it would bring comfort and peace to a troubled heart. And the Jesus solution here to times of perplexity is not a recipe, but this relationship that we have with Christ. Again, believe is an imperative. To believe in God, believe in me, to act on it. Uh, and, and you know, uh, if you know me, you know that I'm not into brands or not into the, all those things, but I do love um, the Nike sneakers. Talk about shoes and that. I love the motto, just do it. Just do it. You can talk about it. You can strategize about it. You can, you can pray about it. You can, you can sit there and discuss it, but there comes a time where you must do it. And here Jesus says, just trust in me. Just believe in me. And third here, he says, there's plenty of room. As 
dwelling places in God's house. There's room for you in my father's house or many mansions or rooms or dwelling places. If it were not true, I would not have told you. I love this understanding. He said, I go to prepare a place for you just as love welcomes, prepares a welcome. Uh, think of expectant parents, uh, prepares a room for a baby. With love, the hostess prepares for her guests. Jesus prepares a place for his people because he loves them and is confident of their arrival. So much to say here. He says, I will come again to receive you to myself. Jesus promised to come again for the disciples. This was not only in the sense of his soon resurrection or in the coming of the Holy Spirit, but Jesus also in mind the great gathering place of his people at the end of the age. He said, there where I am, you will be also. And what he's getting here is this understanding of, of heaven. And, and what is heaven like? You know, we all talk about heaven. You know, we, we talk about uh, heaven, well, um, you know, the pearly gates, right? And there's beauty and splendor and all this. And then we talk about the rooms. I just want, you know, my mansion. Or, you know, well, I won't have them. my heaven. Well, I'll have a 3 2 uh, ranch style, and I'll have this in my den, and, and I'll have this and that. And, and you know, and, and you know, some of us we get to the place, well, I don't know where you're all gonna be, but I'm gonna be in the mountains, I'm not gonna be by the ocean, you know. That's my heaven. And we talk about all this understanding of, of heaven, but I gotta tell you something. I believe that heaven is so much more than what we think of, right? And when you think of the beauty and the splendor and the majesty and the absolute perfection. And yes, we'll see uh, other believers in, in, that are there. And yes, all those things will be, but the greatest thing is not, not that I'll have a room. I don't, you know, I don't care if I have a 10 by 10 or a 12 by 12 or, you know, 1,200 square feet or 4,000 square feet or whatever it is. I, the, the beauty of it all is, is that God will be there. That Jesus and so the idea of, of what is heaven like, it's the idea of that, that the state of perfection, of eternal perfection, and that will be there because we believe in Jesus. And what so you all saying about this, this special music is absolutely beautiful. The fact is, is that Jesus tells us here in just a moment, he, he it's his understanding it's our understanding of believing in Christ, the full atonement of our sins, the only way to heaven. Um, I, you know, now is the time um, that uh, we go on vacations and, you know, summer vacations and we go to the mountains and all of that. We have not been to the mountains in a very, very long time. But I, I love, don't you love family? Well, maybe you don't love family reunions. I don't know. Everybody has, and by the way, I'm Italian, Jewish, and Irish, okay? And it's very interesting. It's a very interesting, our family, okay? And so when things happen, you know, everybody has family dysfunctions, okay? Everybody. I don't care who you are, everybody does. In our family, we just call it La Familia and we move on. But the fact is, is that the, I remember um, my grandparents had a place in Franklin, North Carolina, and we used to go up there. I, I, it was just absolutely beautiful. They they passed away, but I remember uh, going up there before they had passed away, and it was this home. You know, you just thought it was this beautiful, beautiful, huge, beautiful place. And you go back down, and it's not that big of a place. It's not. But the fact is, is that there was always plenty of room and plenty of love and all of that to plenty of plenty of everything to go around because love is dead. And here Jesus is giving us words of, of confidence, comfort, and security for his children. Secondly, words of confidence and strength that come from Christ and Christ alone. Thomas is he, you know, after he says this, Thomas, one of the disciples, he says, where are you are going and how can we know the way? Now, you know, Thomas is the realist. He's the downer. Um, and he gets, you know, he gets a bad rap in some places, but he is the realist. He, he wants to know the facts. He says, give me the bottom line. Give me the facts on the ground. If you're take us, taking us on a journey, if you're taking us on a road, if you're taking us somewhere, where's the map? Where's the atlas? Where's the GPS? And, 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 you know, what are you talking about? That's Thomas. And I got to tell you, anybody, um, um, 
I am technologically uh, whatever. I am not there. I don't know about you all, but I'm not there. I'm, I'm a boomer. My kids and my, my especially my second son, he, he always has a way of saying, Dad, what? You know, I call him up to fix something on the computer or something in my iPhone. He said, you know, Dad, you're too old to have a smartphone. You don't deserve to have a smartphone, you know. And it's like, what are you talking about? You know, it's like, we don't have atlases anymore. We don't have any maps. We have the GPS, right? But when the GPS goes wrong, what do we do, right? And so here Thomas is saying, where is the map? What are you talking about? How do you know the way? And it's here that Jesus reveals three things about him that serves as confidence and strength about who he is. First, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He didn't say that he would show us the way. He didn't say he was a way shower. He said he is the way. He didn't promise to teach us a truth. He said that he is the truth. Jesus didn't offer us the secrets to life. He said that he is the life. I'm wandering about. I don't know where I'm going. Jesus is the way. Or I'm confused and I don't know what to think. Jesus is the truth. Or I'm dead inside and I don't know if I can go on. Jesus is the life. Without the way, there is no going. Without the truth, there is no knowing. Without the life, there is no living. I am the way which thou must follow. The truth in which you must believe. The life in which you must hope. In Greek, he said, I am. Ego may shows force. It's not that I may be. Or I think I am, but it's the I am. Jesus was not ashamed about who he was. He wasn't embarrassed. He didn't shy away from the truth. So I am is the path or the way. Tano Don in Greek is the road, it's the idea of going. The way of life. Jesus, he didn't say I am one of uh, many ways. I'm a power of many powers. Uh, some say that Jesus was the way shower. Uh, no, he's not. Jesus is not some metaphysical um, god or some mystic. Um, aren't you glad we don't worship a mystic Jesus that says, hey, dude, let's kick back and uh, we'll just find our way somehow? Jesus says, I am the way. It answers the question, how can I be saved? The idea, and you all know this, the idea that all roads lead to God is a fallacy. Um, years ago, I was uh, I was on staff at a church in North Miami, and I was asked to. Uh, it was during some very trying times in the late '80s, early '90s, in Dade County, and I was asked to be a part of an interfaith panel comprised of ministers and lawmakers to discuss the social and moral climate uh, in the city. <laughs> Fifteen speakers in three hours. I was Plan B if they needed. So I sat on the side there, and obviously they didn't need me, but I was ready. Um, solutions to drugs and crime and violence, teen pregnancy. Um, out of 15 speakers in three hours, only two mentioned the need for Jesus Christ. Now I got to tell you, I've spoken to the gangs in North Miami, the homosexual agenda in South Beach, counsel teen moms. Children that can see no hope because of domestic violence that's so rampant. Cults that steal the souls of people searching. The child molester steals the innocence from our children. But Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. This is the idea of knowing. How can I be sure? You know, our, our culture is a culture without absolutes. Nothing is always right. Nothing is always wrong. Truth has become this uh, uh, issue where, uh, you know, it, there is no truth. But here we see that truth answers who God is. It refers to his character. Uh, truth embodies what people ought to know and believe of God, what they should do as children of God, what they should be like, how we believe as be, as be, and how we behave as believers. i, I got to tell you, this... Um, the world of which we know in today's world, you wonder why it's so confused. Truth is relative. Um, let me ask you, this is a beautiful sanctuary. And I said, you all have done a tremendous job. What color are the walls? What, what color is this? Let me just ask you, what color is this? Soft white. Okay. It's a white of some sort, right? It's beautiful. 
Okay, someone could come. I could say that it's soft white. Pastor Mike could say, no, no, it's not. It's not soft white. It's purple. You know? <laughs> and someone else could say, no, I don't see purple. I see green. And someone else could say, no, it's more of a lime color. And you know what? According to the culture, everybody's right. <laughs> and then you want to know why we're so confused spiritually and why we're so confused. And that's what it is. It's truth. Has become relative, but here truth tells us what we are to know. Jesus said, I am the truth. Third, I am the life, the idea of living. This answers the question, how can I be satisfied? In Greek, it referred to the quality of life. It includes the cause of life, and Jesus is the source of life. He is the sustainer of life, and there are people that run from, you know this, people run from fad to fad, to thing to thing, to relation to relation, religion to religion. How can I be satisfied? With Christ, there is no living. And he says this, no one comes to the Father except through me. There is no other way to heaven except through Jesus. And this eliminates any kind of universalism or reaching to the Father any way other than through Jesus. You can't buddy up to God. You can't uh, do mighty, wonderful things. You can't make an end run around the cross of Christ only by the means of Christ. And this is so opposite from our culture today with today's zeitgeist, the spirit of the age that says it's fun and cool to be our own, to do our own, and to live in a pluralistic society that just kind of sort of does its own thing without Christ and wants to be rewarded for it. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. i got to tell you, um, I'm going to use an illustration on my phone, so I'm going to tell you why I do this. It might take a second. And Nobody knows when we're going to have a tragedy, right? And no one knows about, you all have been following the, the building collapse in Surfside. And you all know that this thing happened about 1.30 in the, in the morning, and this thing just went down like that, right? Well, story after story is coming out. The latest is, is about a firefighter's daughter. I don't know if the exact was found in the I don't know if you saw this but, or heard about this. Seven-year-old Stella Caterosi, the daughter of a 10-year-old, 10-year veteran Miami firefighter, was at Ch Champlain Tower South with her mother, grandparents, and aunt when the collapse on the northeastern side of the 12-story building happened last week. The Caterosi family lived in apartment 501, which overlooked the Atlantic Ocean, and Stella shared a room with her mother, grandparents, in the other bedroom. Stella's aunt was visiting from Argentina where three sons waited for a return. It goes on, the story goes on, said that they found her body Thursday night when this the firefighter was made aware that we were close to where the loved ones may have been. They stood beside side by side with some of his other fellow firefighters. We were able to bring her and then at least give him an opportunity to say his farewells. The witness says Stella's father was with his brother and used his jacket to cover his daughter's body, placed a small U.S. flag over her, carried her out of the area. Witnesses said the task force team escorted him to a group of police and firefighters lined up on the roadway. Now, here's a firefighter to find his daughter. Who knew? Nobody knew. No one knew what was going to take place. No one knows what's going to happen. And here, no one knows what's going to happen here. The disciples did not know what was going to happen. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Words of comfort and security from, for God's children, words of confidence and strength for the Master. So what are some lessons that are found from John 14, 1 through 6? First, God is in control. To stop being anxious and give him control. Live like it. Whether we see it or not, whether I understand it or not, God is in control. Secondly, God has plenty of room for his children. He will not abandon us. So just be, live in that security. Third, there's only one way to heaven through Jesus. So have hope. I love the fact that we're never defeated, but we always have hope in Christ. Four, the idea that truth is relative is false. And five, I can live in life fastly when I'm living for Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, when you became a believer in Christ, I, I was saved during the, the Jesus Revolution, 
in, 19, in the late 60s and early 70s, there was a youth movement that swept across the country. It was a popular slogan at the time, one way to Jesus, and Jesus is the way. Um, it was a song that was very popular, Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above them there's no others, Jesus is the way. Um, but i got to tell you, um, it's easy to move from thing to thing and problem to problem, right? obstacle to obstacle when you have hope in Christ. One, one night, though, we were going through the testing for my youngest son. And I heard a song. I was at a at a some pastor's conference, and we had just finished the. Uh, it was a four to six month process to do the testing for our son. He was three at the time, and how difficult it was to go through the process and then find out that yes, he was in fact special needs and autistic. And the song that is called "Rescue" by the Desperation Band says this: "You are the source of life. I cannot be left behind. No one else will do." I will take hold of you. I need you, Jesus. Come to my rescue. Where else can I go? There's no other name by which I'm saved. Capture me with grace. I will follow you. The world has nothing for me, but I will follow you. Words of comfort and security for God's children. Don't let your hearts be troubled. And secondly, words of confidence and strength for the master. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I want to close with understanding. I, I, some of you know this, some of you don't. Um, my dad um, was a Miami police. He was a detective. He was a patrol motorman. He was a vice detective for years. And um, it was very interesting growing up as a kid. That's all I can say. Um, he spoke in, in very short declarative statements. And there was no opinion. We did it, you know, and said, do it. And um, um, there were some times, you know, I may see my dad every day or every night. And then there were times because if he was on some sting or something like that, I may not see him three or four days. And um, we, there was a time in our lives we moved around a, a lot. And um, we had just moved uh, out to a place in, in western count, Dade County called Swamp Water, okay? It was out in the Everglades at the time. Now it's a city, but back then it was just, it was a great place to, you know, had many bike trails, horse trails, dirt roads. Um, but I was starting a new school and getting on a new bus, and I had never been there before, and I, I was very anxious, very worried. And I knew my dad would come in sometimes, um, and I might not see him, but I knew he was there. And so the night before I was to get up, in fact, at that time we had to get up at, uh, I don't know, we had to catch a, catch a bus at 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning kind of thing. It was kind of nuts. It was a split shift type of thing. And here I was, and the night before I went to sleep, what I did not know that my dad had stopped in. And back then, you know those digital clock radios? You know, this was a Julie. I was going to bring it. I still have it. Um, it's a Juliet clock radio that when, when, when the alarm comes on, it turns on the music, okay? Well, now it's nothing, okay? Everything does that. But back then, it was, it was like the thing, okay? And so when I woke up at 5 in the morning, this I looked over, and this clock radio turned on the music. And I knew that my dad had been there, even though I had not seen him, even though I probably not, would not see him for a couple of days. I knew that he was there. And it would be okay. And so when we look at our relationship to Jesus Christ, there are some times where we may not see what is happening. We may not know what is happening. We may be confused. But there is a hope because Jesus said, don't worry. Don't let your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. I'm preparing a place for you. And secondly, he says this. He said, I am the way. Not this stuff out there. But I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And when I look at those words, it's such a time of, of sense of comfort and security for crazy times. I don't know where your uh, your relationship is with Jesus. I don't know where you are in your journey. Maybe maybe you don't. Maybe you do. Um, but in a moment, we're gonna we're gonna pray and we're gonna have a time of invitation.
and we're just going to sing, and Pastor Mike will be here. But if you've never accepted Jesus Christ, we're going to invite you to do this. Maybe you, maybe you just want to come to the altar in prayer. Maybe you want to just get a restart. You, you just haven't been living for Christ. And maybe you, you, you did, but you, things are just not easy. Whatever it is, we're going to ask that. Just don't leave here without doing business with God. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you. I thank you, Father, for, for saving me. I thank you for rescuing me from taking my sins and being the full atonement and for acknowledging and understanding that because I am a sinner and I have given, I, I, I've surrendered my life to you, or I've repented of my sins and given my life to you, and I'm called your children. It's so cool to be a child of the King of Kings. And I pray, Father, there's somebody that's here today that has never accepted you. May they do that. Father, maybe there's somebody that's just, just having a tough time. <laughs> and, it, and, and I just don't know where to go. And so, Father, I pray that they would look to you, not to, the, not to the fad of the day, not to the issue of the day, not to the culture, but, Father, to you and you alone. Maybe there's somebody that just needs to come to the altar and pray, or maybe they just need to get a restart, a chart, restart of faith. But whatever it is, we pray that we make decisions today, please. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 If you'll please stand. have hope because we have Jesus. Amen? Amen. Uh, um, as, we, as we walk out the door here in a moment, I'm going to have Brother Marty uh, come and, and stand with me on the, uh, outside in the foyer if you'd like to greet him on your way out. Thank you for coming. Uh, that would be, that'd be appreciated. Um, I don't think we have any announcements, do we? Nothing else? No. I don't think we have anything. anything. My, uh, the, men's, the men's breakfast that was postponed from yesterday is coming up this Saturday. Saturday at 10 a.m., Fellowship Hall in the back. Uh, all men and boys are invited to come. And so we'll eat good and we'll have a short Bible study. So if you're, if you're a guy, that includes you. Okay, so 10 o'clock, uh, men's breakfast and uh, the Fellowship Hall in the back, uh, the back building. So are you glad to be in the house of the Lord today? Yes. I know I am. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I just want to come before you today. I want to thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that we've had to, to hear Lord, a word from you. Father, a familiar passage to many of us. But Father, we needed that encouragement today. And I do ask, Lord, that you would encourage us as we walk out these doors. Father, to remember, Lord, that you are the, tr the way, the truth, and the life. So, Father, as we walk out these doors into the mission field, help us to share that truth. 